Hello students, and welcome to Sex Ed for Adults. So the reason that I like to start the semester with Sex Ed is that I have no way of knowing what you already know. One of the problems with Sex Ed in America is that we change how we do it state by state, so you might have had a completely different kind of sex education than the person next to you. Also, we don't really tell the truth in Sex Ed in America, so everything that you learned might have been a lie. So since I don't know what you know already, I'm just going to start at the beginning and make sure that we all have the same set of information. So, everything I'm going to tell you today is true, but everything I'm going to tell you today assumes that you are an adult, and that you are a sexually active adult, or you would like to be sexually active soon. So there is going to be some adult information and a lot of pictures. Let's get started. So I like to start with anatomy, because it's pretty simple, and I like to start with the penis, because it's extremely simple. Basically, there are two parts. There is the head, and there is the shaft, and really that's about it for penises. <laughs> it does get slightly more complicated than that, but basically what you need to know is that there are two parts on the outside. The shaft is the long part that sticks out, and the head is the part at the very end of that. The head is the most sensitive part of the penis. That's where most of the nerve endings are collected, and that's why penises come equipped with their own hood, so that you don't get too much stimulation from the nerve endings. In America, it's pretty common to circumcise baby boys, so for reasons that are basically unclear, we remove the hood, which does end up deadening the nerve endings. So for a lot of men who have had circumcisions, they actually have less feeling in the head of their penis than they would have had if they had left the foreskin intact. So this is one of the reasons that circumcision is kind of going out of style. But anyway, this is essentially what a penis looks like. You'll notice that there are those two parts. When a penis gets erect, it does not activate a bone, it does not activate a muscle. Basically what happens is a lot of blood flows into the penis that was previously elsewhere in the body, and it fills up this sort of spongy tissue. You can see it here in this cross section, it's called the corpus cavernosum, and basically there's like one tube on each side of the penis. Normally they're just kind of chill, they're just kind of flat, they sit there, but when they fill up with blood, they become so full that the penis becomes hard. And so that's how erections happen. There really is no muscle, there's not a single bone in there, it's just blood that essentially flows into the penis and then gets trapped. So the way that Viagra works is that it allows the blood to flow in as much as possible, but it stops it from coming back out. So Viagra does not give you an erection if you couldn't already get one, it just sort of helps. So you'll notice that at the end of the penis there is only one opening. That is the urethra. It has two functions. Basically it releases urine and semen. So, in the male body, it does two things. The other thing that I want to draw your attention to are the testicles. Typically, there are two. Typically, the left one hangs a little bit lower than the right one. Don't know why, most men are just right-handed. And the one thing that is kind of interesting about testicles is that they move more than any other external part of the body. So they like to remain about two degrees cooler than the rest of the body, so they will move up and down outside the body as needed in order to either get warmer or stay cooler. So that's kind of interesting. But other than that, they're not particularly useful, they're very sensitive, so having them on the outside of the body is kind of an unusual choice. A lot of other animals keep their testes tucked up inside just in case. Another thing that's important to know about penises is that there are lots of varieties. They come in all sorts of sizes and shapes, circumferences, some of them are long, some of them are short, they can point up or down, they can point left or right. Pretty much all of that is completely normal. If you have any pain, especially in regard to erections, then you should see the doctor. But if you're curious about the color being a little bit different than what you've seen before, or the bend being a little bit different than what you've seen before, you're probably just fine. They tend to do all sorts of things, not something to worry about. The other thing that people get very concerned with in regard to penises is size. And this is kind of unfortunate, because there's nothing you can do about your size. It just is. No amount of Viagra or stretching or pills is ever going to change the size of your penis. I'm sorry. They're working on it. They're trying. Penis enlargement surgeries, but so far no luck. So, the average penis is really about three to five inches, typically about four inches in circumference, and a lot of people don't know this because normally the penises that we see are in pornography. And in porn, typically the actors have about an eight inch penis. As you can imagine, this is substantially bigger than a five inch penis. So one thing to keep in mind is that even though you've seen a lot of these penises in porn, those people are actually kind of genetic abnormalities. This isn't something you should expect for yourself. You should just find the person who likes your penis just as it is. Next, we'll move into female anatomy. 
this can get a little bit more complicated. So let's look at this picture and we'll work our way from the outside in. So on the outside, we have the labia majora. These are sort of fatty tissue. They're actually designed to prevent you from getting hurt if you're having sex in the missionary position, which is kind of nice. So you've got those little fat pads there on purpose. The next part is the labia minora. And this is often what we call the vaginal lips. And these are made of a different kind of skin. So the labia majora tends to have hair and be sort of like the rest of your skin, maybe on the outside of your arms or legs. The labia minora might not have any hair, and it might be a different color, a little bit darker sometimes, because the blood vessels are closer to the surface. So the tissue on the labia minora is a little bit more delicate, so remember to be careful with that. Next, if we start at the top and in the middle, we have the clitoris. Now the clitoris is super interesting. For one thing, it's much bigger than we usually give it credit for being. Normally, we just talk about the little part that sticks out, which is probably about the size of the end of your pinky, but it's a whole horseshoe shape, and parts of it wrap around the outside of the vagina, which might be why some women can orgasm from vaginal penetration, but that's something we'll get to later. The clitoris, much like the head of the penis, comes with its own protective shield. So it has a little hood, and if a woman is sufficiently stimulated, the hood will retract. But for most of the time, the hood covers the clitoris, and that's because there are like eight or 9,000 nerve endings just on that part of the clitoris. It is by far the most sensitive part of the human body. The end of your finger, for example, has about 2,000 nerve endings, so you can imagine why it needs its own protective hood. All right, going back to our original drawing. The next thing down is the urethra. So the urethra is the hole out of which urine comes. So some people get this confused because women have a little bit uh, more complicated anatomy and they have more holes than a man might have. So the urethra is where the urine comes out. That's why, for instance, you can pee with the tampon in. The vagina is the next one down. So the vagina is where babies come out and things like penises and toys go in. Uh, it's where your menstrual fluids will come out. And the vagina is not the whole deal. The vagina is really just that one canal. And that's an important thing to remember. Very often people say vagina, but they mean vulva. Next down, you have a little section of skin we call the perineum, and that's basically the skin that separates the vaginal canal and the anus. And then of course, at the bottom, the anus. So female anatomy is a little bit more tricky, but the important thing to remember is that the clitoris is at the top and in the middle. Much like with penises, there's a huge amount of variety in what vulvas look like. They can have lots of hair or very little hair. They can range in color. They can change color depending on how that woman is feeling. They can have large lips or small lips. Pretty much, again, whatever you're working with is fine unless it's causing you pain. So if you're having pain, it's worth going to see a doctor. But other than that, don't worry about it. Whatever you've got is normal. Another thing I wanted to touch on briefly is menstruation. We don't really tell people about menstruation as often as we should or with as much detail as we should. So here's a short overview of what's going on there. So basically about every 28 days, much like the moon, women build up the lining in their uterus and then shed the lining in their uterus. We do this just in case we conceive. So basically there's only a few days of the month where you can get pregnant. We'll talk later about how you can use this to control your fertility. But if you think about it in a cycle, like we have it in this picture, there's a part of the month where your uterus is ready to accept an egg, and there's a part of your month where the uterus is getting rid of the eggs. So basically, it's just a continuous cycle that goes over and over. It's normal to have like four to six tablespoons worth of menstrual fluid come out, but you do reabsorb two thirds of it every month. So basically, you build a little nest, and then you take the nest apart, and then you build the nest, and then you take the nest apart. So if your pain is really, really severe, that is worth going to see a doctor. Uh, very often we don't correctly diagnose people with things like PCOS or endometriosis. So it's normal to have a little bit of pain right before your period, especially in the three to five days prior to it, but it's not normal to have a crazy amount of pain. So again, probably what you're doing is normal, but if you're having pain, that is worth going to see a doctor. Another thing I wanted to touch on is that we think of bodies as being exclusively male or exclusively female, but that really isn't the case. Historically, we thought of it as being bimodal, which means you have one option, two option, the end. But these days, we think of it as sort of more of a spectrum. The more we learn about the human body, the more that we find that there's a huge amount of variation in the way that you can express your gender or biological sex. 
So usually we determine these things via the sex organs, internal or external, or via the chromosomes. But what we're finding is that people are born on a huge range of bodies in the middle. So if your body doesn't look like the typical male or female body, or if you're hooking up with somebody who doesn't have the typical male or female body, again, unless there's pain, don't worry about it. Just have a good time. The next thing we're going to talk about are different kinds of sexual interactions. So remember, there's all sorts of things you can do, again, on a huge scale, and you can choose what suits you, what suits your partner, what suits a specific occasion, and remember that you never have to do any of these that you are uncomfortable with. So, let's start with masturbation, because this is where most people start, which is great, because masturbation is the safest sex you can have, and it's also a really good way to get to know your own body and figure out what you like and what you don't like and what works for you. So we're pretty sure that men masturbate a little bit more than women, but this kind of thing is difficult to measure because people do lie to us and there are a lot of stigmas still about women being sexual. We're also pretty sure that people about your age, undergraduates, tend to masturbate more frequently than people who are older, so it's very normal if you're masturbating up to several times a week. So again, be mindful of what you're doing, be mindful of your roommates, uh, but masturbation typically is the safest and it also has a lot of health benefits. The next kind of sexual interaction that people typically partake in is using your hands. So this could be something like fingering someone or giving someone a hand job, and typically this is pretty safe. There are some diseases that can transfer back and forth just by using your hands, but again, generally speaking, this is one of the safest kinds of sexual interaction. Just remember that you should always wash your hands and you should probably trim your nails. The next thing that people tend to like to do is oral sex. Now one thing that's interesting about oral sex is that there's a different word for it when it's for men than when it's performed on women. So when it's performed on women, it's called cunnilingus, and when it's performed on men, it's called fellatio. Except, of course, that no one ever uses those words. So call it whatever people are calling it where you are. One important thing to remember about cunnilingus is that different women like it different ways. So it's very important that you use your words to talk to your partner about what specifically works for your body. Another thing to remember if you are a penis-having person is that penises are typically about five inches long, but mouths all the way from the teeth to the back of the throat are usually about three inches long. So as you can imagine, it might be that the whole thing doesn't fit. So if someone is kind enough to put your penis in their mouth, remember to be considerate about how far you force it in. The next kind of sex that people typically have is vaginal sex. And this is often what we think of when we hear the word sex, is basically penis and vagina. And that's not wrong, necessarily. This is a very popular way to have sex. Historically, it's been a very popular option. But it is only one kind of sexual experience that you could have. So here in this drawing, you'll notice it's a cross-section of essentially where the penis is when it goes inside a vagina. And it is interesting because in this drawing, the G-spot is highlighted. The G-spot is what we call the Grafenberg spot because the first white man to write something down gets to name it. So the Grafenberg spot is thought to be a very sensitive spot that can cause uh, sexual pleasure for women. This one also shows the A spot, a slightly less popular, less talked about spot that might also cause a certain amount of pleasant sensation because it has a lot of nerve endings. So penis and vagina sex, pretty simple. You're probably familiar. I imagine you've seen it on video. The one thing to remember is that the risk does go up here, especially in regard to what kind of birth control you use and what kind of sexual protection you use. So with oral sex, the risk is a little bit lower. With vaginal sex, it goes up a little bit more. And with this next kind of sex, it goes up even more. So the next thing we're going to talk about is anal sex. Anal sex is pretty egalitarian. Anyone can participate because pretty much everybody has an anus. We typically think about this with men, but that's not necessarily exclusive to men. One reason that a lot of men do like anal sex is because of the prostate gland. So the prostate gland is on sort of the front of the rectum, a couple of inches in, and it is also a bundle of nerves that can bring a surprising amount of pleasure. So there are two things that I want you to keep in mind if you're thinking about anal sex. And one is that the anus does not make its own lubrication. So the vagina does, the mouth does, but the anus does not. So you will need to use lubrication to make this happen. The other thing is that the tissue surrounding the anal canal is very, very sensitive and it can tear easily. So one of the reasons that diseases get spread so quickly from people who are having anal sex is because it's prone to fissures, is what we call it. So if you are going to have anal sex, remember to use lubrication and go slow. 
So if you're having a good time and you're doing the kinds of things that you like, you might experience an orgasm. So orgasms are really interesting, but basically the human sexual response follows kind of a bell curve. There's a period of excitement leading up to the orgasm itself, and then a period of calming down, which we call the refractory period, which is the time between orgasms. For women, the refractory period can be very short. You might have multiple orgasms in the same sexual you know, experience. For men, the refractory period can be a little bit longer, ranging from 15 minutes up to like a day. So don't be worried if your refractory period is long, it just means that you're recharging your batteries. Another thing that's interesting about orgasms is that men typically figure out how to have them relatively early in their lives, and they continue to have them in the vast majority of their sexual experiences. Women, however, are often blocked from learning how to do this, and it can be a little bit more complicated for women in general. So for women, very often they don't experience orgasm in their first several sexual experiences, and they don't experience it every time until typically about middle age. It takes a while to learn what you want and to learn how to demand it, so if you, as a young woman, are not having an orgasm every time, maybe find out more about your body and maybe demand what you want. Now, when you do have an orgasm, essentially two things happen. One is bodily. You experience a series of muscular contractions. The other is in your brain. You experience a flood of chemicals. And these are great chemicals. These are our favorite chemicals. Uh, so there's dopamine, which is one of the pleasure chemicals. There's serotonin, which is one of the happiness chemicals. There's all sorts of things. Adrenaline sometimes. Basically, your brain gets flooded with all of the things that you like. In some cultures, they believe that you are the clearest and the closest to God in the moments after your orgasm, because those are the times when your mind is the happiest and freshest. Now, one of the things that's especially interesting about orgasm is ejaculation. So most men orgasm and ejaculate together every time. It's certainly possible that you can orgasm without ejaculating and that you can ejaculate without orgasming, but most of the time for men, they do happen together. Essentially what happens is that the sperm come out from the testes through these long, long tubes, and they go through the seminal vessels, and they go through the prostate, and what they pick up is essentially some liquid that keeps them protected. So vaginas have a pH balance that's actually pretty basic, which is the opposite of acidic. I'm not saying vaginas are basic, although I do love that phrase. But what that means is that the sperm can't survive in the vagina by themselves. They need a protective liquid coating, and that's what the semen is. It's basically like a, an escort that allows it to travel through the penis and on into the vagina safely. So while it's traveling through the male body, it picks up this seminal fluid, and then it exits out the urethra. How fast it goes when it exits? It's actually a matter of scientific study, and we're pretty sure it goes fast, maybe as much as 15 miles an hour, which is why you can't jump out of the way, which is why the withdrawal method does not always work. We'll get there later. Can women ejaculate, you ask? Yes. We don't know very much about it, in part because we don't study women's health issues, and we certainly don't put a lot of money into women's sexual health issues, which is its own problem, but we're pretty sure that some women can ejaculate, it's just that we're not sure where it comes from. So if you look at this graph, you can see the G-spot again highlighted, and what we think happens is that the skein gland next to it releases the liquid and not the bladder, but again, the jury is out because women's sexual health is often ignored. But if you are one of the women who can ejaculate, good for you. If you're not, you might be able to learn. But regardless, as long as you're having a good time, you're fine. The next thing we're going to talk about is how babies happen. The interesting thing about how babies happen is that it's incredibly complex. It's kind of a miracle that it happens every time. But it's still something that seems to surprise people, so let's talk about it. So first of all, men make sperm in their testes. And what's interesting about that is that they have a nearly unlimited supply. Pretty much every time you ejaculate, you make 300 to 500 million sperm. And you can make more tomorrow. Women, on the other hand, are born with as many eggs as they're ever going to have. So what happens with women is every month, one of your ovaries releases an egg. Sometimes they take turns, sometimes they accidentally release two, that's where twins happen. But basically, every month, whoever's turn it is, um, an egg becomes ready and then it kind of bursts out of your ovary in an actually kind of gross way. Um, it's picked up by these little fingers on the ends of the fallopian tube and drawn into the fallopian tube. Now, if sperm is present, 
it has this whole time been working its way uh, through the uterus, up the fallopian tube, and now it's time for it to try to break into the egg. So it is a myth that you are the result of your father's first and fastest sperm. You are the result of your father's probably like 20th or 30th sperm. It takes a while to break through the outside of the egg. So the sperm that finally does it is the one uh, that fertilizes the egg, and then they begin the cell division process, which you probably learned about in middle school. And ultimately, if everything goes well, a few days later, the egg itself will implant in the side of the uterus. Sometimes it doesn't implant in the uterus, it might implant in the fallopian tube, that's what we call an ectopic pregnancy, and those are very dangerous because that doesn't work. But if you're lucky, it will implant itself in the uterus, and then it might grow into a baby, or not. Probably about one in four pregnancies actually takes. Our body gets rid of a lot of pregnancies that just were never going to work because the cells were wrong or something like that. So miscarriages are actually incredibly common, we just don't talk about it. Perhaps, however, you are interested in preventing babies. Always a good choice, especially if you're focusing on your education. So if you would like to prevent babies, there are essentially two main methods that we use. One is the barrier method, and that essentially prevents sperm from just going anywhere. You don't want it to even get out of the vaginal canal. Barrier methods are probably familiar to you. Condoms are especially popular, but they also used to have a lot of variations on like diaphragms and sponges and that sort of thing. So again, the number one most popular method is a barrier method. However, we also have hormonal methods. And these are things like the pill, the shot, the implants. And these are very effective because essentially what they do is convince your body that it's already pregnant, so it isn't interested in the sperm. It doesn't think it needs it, which is pretty clever. The vast majority of birth control is designed for women. This is unfortunate. Because of course, it would make more sense to have the birth control be on the side of the man. They're the ones that do all of the producing of sperm. But again, medical issues in America being what they are, most of the time it's gonna be the responsibility of the woman. We're testing uh, certain kinds of birth control on men. They're in human trials and I have high hopes, but for now it does tend to fall on the shoulders of the woman. Not all birth control methods are equally effective. So the most effective thing of all, of course, is like a vasectomy or a hysterectomy, just removing those organs altogether. But one of the most effective and safe options that I would recommend, especially for college students, is an IUD. So this is an intrauterine device, and there's two different kinds. One of them is copper, and we don't know why, but sperm hate copper and vice versa, so it works. The other is hormonal. And these are like 99% effective. The copper one is good for 10 years. The hormonal one is good for five years. And it's a really good option for busy young women because you put it in once and then you don't have to think about it again for years. A lot of women choose the pill and the pill is also an excellent option. But it is important that you take it at roughly the same time every day because that increases its effectiveness. And it is also important that you take it every day, which can be hard to remember. However, after that, lots and lots of options. There's vaginal rings, there's diaphragms, there's the withdrawal method, which is a little bit more effective than we like to admit, but I'm sure you've heard the famous joke, what do we call people who use the withdrawal method? Parents. It might work nine out of 10 times, but those odds are not good enough if you're trying to prevent pregnancy. There's also a sort of fertility-based awareness, and this is what I was talking about earlier in regard to the rhythm. So basically, if you're aware of where you are in your cycle, if you're a woman, you can know if you're likely to get pregnant or not get pregnant. So this leaves you able to have sex safely about half of the month, and then half of the month not safely. Again, not a great system, especially when you have other options available to you. So if you're interested in preventing pregnancy, remember you can always find affordable birth control at clinics and at Planned Parenthood and something like that. And it's always cheaper to be on birth control than it is to have a baby. Another thing that's important to remember about birth control is that just because you're not the person who's going to get pregnant doesn't mean you're not responsible for your own sexual health. So if, for instance, you are a penis having person, carry your own condoms. If you're trying to have sex with someone who has a penis, but they insist that the condom is too small, do not have sex with that person. They don't deserve it. If their penis is legitimately so big that it won't fit in a normal condom, they should have brought their own condom. So don't be fooled by people who don't want you to use birth control. You are the only person who is responsible for your own sexual health. There are a lot of really interesting myths about conception and pregnancy, and I wanted to address a few of them. 
So one is that you can't get pregnant the first time you have sex. Unfortunately, you totally can. One is that you can't get pregnant when you're on your period, and it is very, very unlikely, but it does have to do with the regularity of your periods. If your periods are particularly irregular, not a safe bet. Some people think that you can't get pregnant if you're breastfeeding a baby already, and it is true that your body is less likely to become pregnant if you're breastfeeding, but again, it's not 100%. Uh, some people think you can jump up and down afterwards, not gonna help. Sperm are very small, they don't know much about gravity. Uh, some people used to douche with coke and that sort of thing. Please don't do that, it's not good for your vagina, also it won't help. Um, I'm sure you know some other good myths. I wish we were in person so you could tell them to me. But basically, if you don't wanna get pregnant, please use science. So the next thing we're gonna talk about are sexually transmitted infections. We used to call them sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, but these days we call them STIs because we realize that most of the time it's a bacterial infection and not a disease. So, One thing I want to tell you is that there's not going to be a lot of graphic scary pictures. I am not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to let you know what to look for in case it comes up. A lot of the sexually transmitted infections that have plagued people throughout history are actually curable now. So it's not the like death sentence that it used to be, and also I'm not trying to introduce a lot of guilt into your sexual lives. I just want you to be as safe as possible. So, let's start with the three most historically popular ones. First, gonorrhea. So gonorrhea is a bacterial infection, and that means it can be cured by antibiotics. So this is one of the infections that we figured out how to cure with penicillin, and we've been doing it that way ever since. So you might notice that you have gonorrhea if you have a sort of mucousy discharge or if you have a lot of pain uh, during intercourse or during urination. And it might show up a few days to a week after uh, the contraction. So the cure for gonorrhea is simple penicillin. So this is always, always one that you want to get checked for. Next, syphilis. You've probably heard of syphilis because it's been around for so many hundreds of years. Lots of very famous people have had syphilis. It seems to inspire people to take over Poland. We don't know why. But this is a pretty common disease. Again, these days, curable with antibiotics. So syphilis usually manifests also as a discharge, but also sometimes as kind of a sore and itchy rash. Usually you won't see the rash until it's pretty well established in your body. That's something that can take years to build. So for the most part, if you're keeping an eye on yourself and your sexual partners, you're most likely to see the discharge. The onset for syphilis can be just a couple of days or a couple of months. So again, that's why it's important to get checked regularly. Next, chlamydia. So chlamydia, also a bacterial infection, also curable with penicillin. Chlamydia also has a long social history, and it also typically manifests as discharge or pain during urination or sex. So again, this is why it's important to get checked pretty regularly, because this one can show up two to six weeks after contraction. Another thing that's important about chlamydia is that people are often asymptomatic, especially women. So women can be carriers of chlamydia and not know it for months, maybe even years. So again, get checked regularly. Next, I want to tell you about herpes. So herpes can be especially tricky because there's two different kinds. And in short, we usually just call them oral and genital, but they can go back and forth. You could definitely get one strain on both parts of your body or two strains on both parts of your body. The other thing that's tricky about herpes is that it can be spread by skin to skin contact. So even though you're not interacting with bodily fluids, you might still contract this. The other thing that's tricky about herpes is that we don't necessarily have a cure for it. We do have excellent repressive pills, so you can essentially take these pills so that you don't have any more outbreaks. But a lot of people have one outbreak and then never another one, or a lot of people have it but they tend to be asymptomatic. So you might have it and not know that you're shedding cells and giving it to your partners. So it's very important that you do get tested for herpes so that you can behave in a responsible manner. Next, we'll talk about HPV, the human papillomavirus. And one of the things that's really interesting about HPV is that you probably already have it. You might even have already had it and discharged it from your own body. Sometimes bodies are able to spontaneously rid themselves of this one, which makes it super interesting. That said, the other thing that's really interesting about HPV is that we've recently invented a vaccine. So you may have already had the vaccine. Typically, we try to get people to start it before the onset of sexual activity. 
and the vaccine prevents the worst, worst cases of what it can do. Because for the vast majority of people who have HPV, it's no problem. It exists, it leaves, whatever. But it can cause warts and it can cause cancer. So it is always a good idea to get the vaccine if you're able to, but it's also a good idea to wear protection because even if you already have HPV and it's not a problem for you, it could be a problem for your next partner. So it's always worth preventing. The final kind of infection that I wanna talk about is HIV and AIDS. So HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus, and AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. So essentially what happens is that a virus gets into your body and replicates itself over and over and attacks your immune system. So this can be very dangerous because often what ends up happening is that your immune system is so weak that you die of other things because you're unable to prevent. So HIV and AIDS used to be a death sentence. It used to be extraordinarily dangerous and extraordinarily fast. We've come a really long way in terms of treating. So we haven't yet figured out how to prevent it entirely, but we have figured out great ways to treat it and it's no longer a death sentence. You can live comfortably with HIV for decades and decades. So you should still protect yourself because it can still be incredibly dangerous, but there are a lot of beautiful protective systems that are out there now and there's a lot of amazing drugs that can enable you to live with it if you do become infected. Again, the most important thing that you can do is just protect yourself. Always wear protection, always get tested regularly, and really the most important thing you can do is be open and honest with your partners. You have to take care of you. You should only ever do things that you're comfortable with, and you should only ever have sex with people that you're comfortable with. But it's also very important that you are comfortable enough to have this conversation with anybody that you might be interacting with sexually. If you feel like you can't ask that person about their sexual health, you probably should not have sex with them. Meh, you know, pick your partners wisely, use your words, get tested all the time, and just be as safe as possible. I would never tell you not to have sex, but I am gonna tell you to be as safe as possible. So, unfortunately, since we're not live, I can't take any of your questions, but I hope that you have them. So if you think of something, please leave a comment underneath. Please send me an email. Please look me up. I'd be delighted to answer your questions about sex. So, I hope you learned something today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.